Monday class. How are you? The most important factor to prevent child slavery is education. Challenging Heights, founded to keep children out of slavery. Many students here are former slaves. Some are so traumatized, they shut out the world around them. James Kofi Annan built Challenging Heights with his own money. He understands child slaves. He was one. Child slavery must not continue. It's not fair. It is just not fair. And that is why I've devoted my time. I want to dedicate my life to fight it because it's not fair. It makes me feel I've been cheated. So others must not be cheated. James was forced to work on fishing boats. It takes eight hours to reach the remote village where he was enslaved. This is the place that I started working first when I was six years old. Early morning, around three o'clock, I woke up from the village and I would come here and start working. Physically, the work is very difficult and they hit you so hard and blood will come out of you. On this day, James came face to face with his childhood. He was hit with a paddle, you know, in the head. And this reminds me of my childhood when I used to work here. He asked these slaves, who wants to go to school? After seven years of slavery, James escaped. At age 14, James learned to read with the help of kindergartners. He eventually earned a college degree. James sees his survival as a sign he is destined to help others. The life I have, the enlightenment, the strength I have, is a lot that has been given me. Now James gives it all back. He uses school, sports, and cultural activities to keep these kids free from slavery. After all, he says, it's only fair. Look at the joy children are having today. At least I've done something to bridge the gap between slaves and freedom. And that makes me so, so passionate, happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. So without further ado, I would like to welcome James Kofi Annan, the founder of Challenging Heights and the executive, executive director of the organization, the winner of the Frederick Douglass Freedom Award, the World Education Promoter of the Year Award, Barclays Bank Africa Community Award winner, Barclays Bank Global Community Award winner, and a personal friend of mine and someone that has changed my life and taught me to live each day with passion, perseverance, and determination. A warm welcome and a quaba to James Kofi Annette. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good evening, everybody. And um, Thank you all for your warm reception. I especially want to extend uh, warm gratitude to Beth and Janelle and all the faculty members for making this possible this evening. I bring you greetings from Challenging Heights, Ghana, uh, the children, the teachers, all our staff. Uh, today is a very important moment for our interaction uh, coming to Grand Valley for the first time, of course, to Michigan for the first time. And I'm so excited about me coming and uh, being with you. As you could see on the screen, it's basically about some childhood experiences 
that has been turned into uh, something I'll call a success story. And I believe that it is through this kind of story that has made some difference in the life of a child. That difference that I would have wished I had when I was a child, that I never had the opportunity of having, is what we are now experiencing in the life of these children. I am the last born of the 12 children of my mother. So my mother, if you were a coach, would have set up a football team and one reserve. <laughs> and being the last born of the 12 children and knowing that all the other children did not go to school and all the other children possibly were also enslaved, it was just normal that I also fell asleep because that's what everybody knew. My parents were illiterate, all the other 11 were illiterate. So when I was six years old, I also followed the same path of being trafficked from my hometown to a fishing industry in the water lake. Now, as a child of six, I was, I was naive, I was ignorant, I didn't know whatever was happening. All I could remember at this moment was that I was trafficked together with six other children. And as I stand here with you, those of us, the six children who were trafficked, we are three surviving at the moment. And I'm the lucky one to be one of those three to be surviving. The other three could not survive and all died for various reasons. And it is important for me, for me to say that I'm so privileged to have been the one among the three to survive. I remember was on the lake working. Every day we needed to wake up at 3 a.m. as a child of six years. And just imagine this room and this temperature waking up at dawn, 3 a.m. And you needed to start your hard work right from the beginning. I cut the I cut, uh, uh, paddles, I pull nets, fetch water from the, uh, from the canoe. All the hard work that was needed to ensure that the fishing business progressed was done by me at that age, right from that age of six. Significant amongst all these activities was the fact that I came under so much severe abuse. You can name it. Physical, verbal, emotional, sexual, whatever you can think of. I had to go through it. Now, so as privileged as I am, that I now have education, good education at that, because at the moment I have my master's degree. It's not everyone who went into the same situation, who was able to survive. And therefore, I see it as an obligation. That is why our motto is, to whom much is given, much is expected. Because for the fact that I survived, and the fact that I am able to gain some education, is enough to say that my life was prepared for such a time like this to be able to tell the stories of the numerous children who were not able to survive to tell their story. Or even those who have survived but who are not educated enough to be able to have a voice. I believe that I stand at an advantage point to break that gap, to say that I have a voice for them. In somewhere 1987, when I escaped, and in, in fact, it's not easy for me to have escaped. I attempted it three times, never succeeded. It came through some circumstances that I was able to escape. First time I tried to escape, they just tied a noose, a rope, a very big rope, 
made the noose around my neck and pull it around the community. Just pull it like an animal. You know how sometimes goats are pulled. They pull it around the community to serve as deterrent to other children who might want to escape. And I still have the scar here. So for all the three times that I attempted to escape and I was caught, the consequences were so severe. And the chances of being caught for attempting to escape was very high because the places were not accessible. In fact, I remember for two years continuous, I saw a vehicle once for two years because there's no road access. And the only boat that can go to the place goes once in a week. And it is the same boat that you are going to escape with that your own trafficker or master is also no, trans, no, also be in, going to the market. So definitely you'll be caught. Now, when finally I was able to escape, it was now between my survivor in terms of basic needs of food and all of that and my education. The chances are that if I don't go to school, I'll end up back. And I was 13 when I finally was able to escape. And just imagine a 13-year-old boy who doesn't know how to even recite A, B, C, D. Who doesn't know even how to recite 1, 2, 3, 4. 13-year-old boy. How could I gain that edu education combined with hard work also to earn a living? Because at that time, my father, my father just ignored me, just forsook me. My mother was ready to take me, but my mother was invalid. And therefore, I had to be able to work for myself, feed myself, clothe myself, whilst I was gaining education. This is the terrible circumstance that I had to go through. Sometimes I had to go on empty stomach for days, living on coconuts, climbing coconuts. And he knows uh, some of the coconuts, I've seen some of the coconuts already, and Janelle. Go to the beach to have fishermen because I still retain the skills wait for people for, for them to pay me to get something to eat, something just to eat, so that I'll be able to, to have the strength to learn. That is the situation that was, I was confronted with. But through all these things, something motivated me. That look, once, even with all these courtes, it's better for me than to be in that enslavement. I prefer this situation, that situation of impoverishment, of deprivation, to that enslavement. Because in that enslavement when I used to be, we were used like objects, animals. I remember there was a time that I was asked to pull the lead. You know, when you cast a net, usually the lead would have to sink down whilst the cock is up. And I made a mistake. Obviously, as a child, I would make a mistake. And one of the older people, standing far at the end of the canoe, just grabbed one tawny fish. You know, there are some fishes that have tongues, very long tongues, here and at the back. And the tongues also had traps on them. He just stood just far away there, threw the, the tawny fish, the live tawny fish, like that. And every part of the tongues stuck into my flesh like this. And you know, fishes cannot live outside waters. So the fish just struggled back. And in the process of struggling back, it just came out with my flesh. Just pulled the flesh out with all the three tongues. And the blood was oozing all over. Just because I made a mistake. So that is the kind of situation that I try to avoid as a child. But for me, it is good news that finally I was able to make it. At least I set a record in my basic school, which is the, that record is still there unbroken. Made it to high school, made it to the university, and I got a job at Barclays Bank of Ghana. Now, all these things 
I believe, were preparing me for things like this, to be able to help others, other children who might not have had the privilege of escaping on their own. And that is where Challenging Heights was born. Challenging Heights is basically to rescue children from that slavery circumstances, rehabilitate them, give them back hope, and reintegrate them into society, and for them to have meaningful lives, so that they can live independent lives, so that they can avoid enslavement. And that is exactly what Challenging Heights is doing. At the moment, like uh, Annie said, I've won four international awards. But it is not the win of the award that is important to me, per se, but the partnership that we have together like this, being able to discuss the issues, that it shouldn't be the case again for a child of six years, and now we are even having four-year-old ch children, being enslaved in that cold lake weather, working day and night, from 3 a.m. to 8 p.m., sometimes even days, that situation must not ha happen again in any child's life. What I have gone through and the education I have, I believe that it is enough for me to say that it is a slavery circumstance. It is. It is also important for me to to expand the origins of these children who do not even know, some of them do not even know where they come from. Some are, some are classified to be missing children. Some are likely to be, have been abducted. Some are in, uh, uh, tricked into the situation. Some are even, have even lost their roots because probably they were, they were trafficked when they were two years. And the trafficker believes that it makes them feel that they are their own children, and therefore they are lost. 15 years, 14 years, they are lost. That's the kind of thing that we are working against now. And that is what Challenging Heights stands for. At the beginning, it was enslavement. But at the end, I believe that it has turned into a success story. All the scars that I had from the beginning, all the kind of pains that I went through, I remember one of the time, and that should be my, probably my last story. The boy, the, the, I would say the older boy who I was entrusted with to look after me in terms of the work, training me and all of that, began to take advantage of me sexually. And this story, I don't, because of cultural reasons, normally, I would not tell. And any time he tried to do that, and I tried to stop him, it was like, count your punishment and your abuse double food. So it's a warning that if I try to make people aware of it, I, should, I, sh I will be punished more than ever before. And I had to endure this thing for two good years. Nobody hearing about it, keeping it to myself, crying within. I don't have a voice. I can't report. And I can't, there is nothing I can do about it. And I live with this thing even now. I see this person walking around. And just imagine the psychological trauma that follows me on this situation. So the passion and the enthusiasm to get more children out of slavery circumstances is informed by this kind of things. Because the more I assist these children out of slavery and give them hope and uh, try to rehabilitate them, it becomes a healing balm for me. I, I feel I'm getting healed and I'm helping myself to this. So never again would, should this thing happen to other children. 
And that is what I tell myself. Thank you so much for hearing me. And um, I hope that there will be opportunity for us to interact more. Thank you so much. run around with a microphone. I know I'm pretty much speechless right now, but if somebody is able to talk and actually ask a question of James, I'll just walk around with a microphone and, and uh, James is happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah. Who owned the fishing company that you were, were enslaved in? W was it a local m market business or was it more of a corporate situation or was it totally isolated from society? Thank you. Um, I work with different fishing companies and they are all owned by local fishermen uh, in various communities. So, Sometimes we, we have something called re-trafficking. Sometimes I work with this businessman, and once he has negotiated my, my price for two years, he virtually has ownership of me. So if he's not getting enough business or enough fish, he will then re-traffic me to another person because he has two years. So he can do one year to another person, and then I'll come back. So that's what happened. And um, I work with several different business owners. Yeah, but they are all community owners. I noticed in the clip the large number of students that you work with. Uh, once they're secured and they receive their their receiving education, is there any type of mental health counseling or any type of counseling they're able to receive to help them to deal with what's happened to them? Yeah, the program we have is such that they go through 50 days, at least 50 days of rehabilitation. The rehabilitation involves psychosocial counseling where uh, trained counselors counsel them out of that. Then they also helped medically because wherever they were, there was no access to medical care. So we have a nurse that comes to treat them. We also give them very good nutri nutritious food because they, they, in all the time that I spend there, from the 3 a.m. to 8 p.m., in most cases, I ate one a day. So you don't have good nutrition to even help your growth. So we also work on that. So it's a, a program of rehabilitation before we even reintegrate them into their normal communities. Yeah, so that's, that's the program we do uh, before we integrate them. So by the time they are reintegrated, they have somehow shifted from that abuse circumstances. Some of them, in fact, when I was there, my biggest aim was to grow up, have my own business, get other children, and abuse them. So a lot of the children, that is their mindset. So you need to talk them out of that before they go to their normal community and start abusing other children. So that's what we do. Hi, James. Thank you for sharing so much of your story. Uh, I wanted to ask, could you share with us the process that you, that you go through to rescue children? I mean, we, got, we saw the village this past summer where you were enslaved. But if you could give us a, the, the long, drawn-out process that you have to go through in order to rescue children because of the lack of resources there in Ghana. Okay, thank you. Um, re uh, rescue starts from the community. We have two sets of communities. We are designated one as source communities where the children are actually taken from. Then we have another set where we designate destination community where the children are sent to. So the rescue starts from the source community where we do sensitization like this gathering, we bring a lot of the community members together and tell them what the children are going through, the need for them to go to school and all that it goes with it. 
after this is done, then the community members will realize what kind of situation the children are likely to have been going to. Because some of them said the children are out of ignorance. They don't even know what the children go through. So when we bring the realities to them, then they will demand for their children. They will come to us, oh, I, I didn't know. I've trafficked this child. I've done this and all of that. And we take detailed information. Then we trace the children to where they, they have been sent to. One of the communities where you went to. Unfortunately, the communities are so mobile, so tracing is, it takes time. Sometimes it takes about one month, two months before you get one child. Then after we have traced them, we do the rescue. And the rescue, normally we have to uh, do it in the community with the fishermen involved. When we rescue the children, we bring them to the shelter for that 50 day rehabilitation program. Then we send them back to their communities and reunite them with their families. In most cases, we reunite them with their families because we don't have the resources to keep them ourselves. And also, it's um, more or less, a lot of them have their families alive. So we have to reunite them with them. Then we send them to school whilst we support their families to earn an alternative income. Because it's also poverty that drives the, the trade. So that's, that's the process we go through starting from sensitization and then ending with the reintegration. Thank you for coming to GVSU. Um, certainly there must be people in the government that know about the situation, uh, whether it's a regional or national government. How does this persist? Is it the official policy to ignore this? Or why? how can this happen with a government that uh, – you know, is the, the lack of enforcement or complicity? Please tell us more about that. I would not say there is a policy to promote it. What I would say is lack of the implementation of the existing laws on the situation. We have the Children's Act, which was passed in 1998, which actually fronts upon the issue we have the Human Trafficking Act, which was passed in 2005, which also makes it illegal. We also have the Domestic Violence Act that also fronts on it. So we have very good laws that should make it very punitive for anybody to want to enslave. The problem is the enforcement. Because you know, the laws are not being enforced as we would have expected uh, it to be enforced. Also because government is required to put in certain structures and infrastructure to ensure that when prosecution is done, the, the outcome of it, for instance, a parent, my mother had 12 children, like I said. So it is likely that when, if my mother were to be jailed, she would have other children. The state must make provision for the care of those children is my mother who actually sold me. You know, I would say, it was in, in my case, it was my father who sold me. So the state must provide the social services that will enable the other children to be cared for if my father were to be jailed. But that, those services are not there. Those infrastructures are not there. So prosecution then becomes an issue. And it is only prosecution that will deter so many others from doing it. Fortunately for us, we became the first organization to lead in prosecuting and jailing a trafficker in the fishing industry, which is a good thing. Because since that was done, a lot of the traffickers voluntarily returned the children to us, which I believe that has is, is, is been great. But how many prosecutions can we do? You know, the police is, is inadequately resourced. The willingness to go to the unaccessible route is not there, and we are even able to reach further into the various communities than the police because they don't have, we have the boat, they don't have the boat. So these are some of the, the challenges that we face in uh, applying the law. But yes, verbally, you, know, you see commitment on the part of government to say that this is illegal, you can't do it, and all of that. But there's one thing saying it's illegal, and another thing providing the impetus to make the law enforceable. Thank you for coming again. Um, 
my question is, uh, after you made us aware of this problem and the slavery that's happening over there, how can we help as students and uh, as a community here uh, to help you um, improve this program that you have going on? Yeah, I think the first step is what we are taking. For us all to get the knowledge about the issue and create awareness and all of that. And that's a very good thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, already, I've seen signs that some of the students here are volunteering. We had a group coming last year and then this year to another group came. So it's a good thing and we are planning for next year and all of that, which is, which is fantastic. So it's another way of helping. Of course, all that we are doing is as resources. The human resources is there, all right, but you also need material resources. So students can also you know, do fundraising, you know, whatever they can do to contribute towards our work. Because if you look at the cycle, and those who have gone there will tell you that getting the children is very expensive. It costs us $400 to rescue one child, very expensive. But good news is that it costs us only an average of $240 to educate one child for a whole year. So we are trying to do a more preventive actions, getting children educa 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 educated, getting them to know their right. Because see, if you know your right, it's unlikely that somebody would abuse it because if the person abuses it, you stand for your right. So we want to educate, send more children to school as a way of preventing more children from going into it. Because if they go into it, we have to spend $400 to rescue one. So these are some of the things that we can do, you know, around. And also spreading information to your friends, you know, letting them know that they can help in various forms. It doesn't really have to be challenging height alone. It could be any organization involved in, 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 in uh, preventing the, the trafficking situation from occurring. So you can do so many things to help. Of course, I'll be so glad if everybody here gets him or herself involved in challenging height, especially if you start raising funds for us. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Question is, is what does Humanian Heights do to um, kind of reinsert these um, children who have been human trafficked into their society and try and minimize the stigma that's associated with the trafficking? What is traffic? the question again? Um, so, w what it, what it, uh, how has Humanian Heights, um, I guess, how are, are they trying to help? Um, that individuals who have been trafficked, are they trying to help them readapt to society to avoid the stigma okay. that's associated with okay. trafficking? So what do you mean is how is challenging height doing this? Okay. Um, we involve the children that we rescue in so many things that makes them quite powerful to say no to trafficking. For instance, before we reintegrate them, we teach them about human rights, what their rights are. And, and we give them all the helpline information, who they can turn to when their rights are being abused or when are, there's an attempted trafficking on them or even attempted trafficking on other children they know and all of that. So we give them all this information. Now, they are in school, but we know that the temptation to come out of the school because of the limited resources that are available to them is high. So we support the families and we sign agreement with them. After supporting the families, we sign agreement with them that whatever support we are giving you is a grant. Only and only if the child remains in school until it completes. As soon as the child drops out of school, you pay that money, that money turns into a loan, and you pay it with 30% interest. This is an agreement challenging height, goes into with the family, signed, copies to the police and all other stakeholders. And I'm glad to say that since we started this strategy, none of our children have been acquitted, no. Because 
they, they can't afford to pay, and because their businesses are also progressing well, at least official, uh, officially, and they know that the interest rate is very, very high, and they can't pay. So they make sure that the children are in school. But we don't only leave them in that state. We go further. We involve the children in sports, which we support still. Involving them in sports so that the children will know that they have something better than wherever they came from. So that the communities become attractive to them. We involve them in children's rights clubs where they will be taught children's rights issues, other issues around the world, and all of that. We also put them into leadership roles so that they know that they themselves too can make it. Of course, they ultimately they use me as an example. My staff always constantly refer to how I also made it from wherever they are. And this is what we do to make sure that they remain in the community and they are not retrusted. So far, it's been, it's been good. But we know we, there is a gap. And the gap is that the kind of assistance and the support we give to the families and the expectation that they should use part of that uh, support to take care of them in school sometimes affect their, you know, that business that we give them. So we are still working towards it. There's a lot of discussion you know, towards addressing that gap. But the, success, the, the good news is that no attrition so far. You've been talking about um, what you do to rehabilitate and integrate the children that are have already been trafficked, but can you speak a little more on what you do to help prevent trafficking in terms of women's trainings, um, children's rights clubs outside of you know, children that have previously been trafficked, and also community engagement projects that your organization works on? Thank you very much. Um, we, we need to, like I said, it's better for us to prevent the situation from occurring because it's then very cheap. So what we do is we look at all the necessary avenues that, is, that will be able to help in a larger frame of being able to prevent more children into slavery. And we realize that young girls are especially very influential in those very small communities. Traditionally or culturally, it's not accepted for girls to stand up for their rights and to speak and all of that. But when you're able to get one or two to stand up, they are very influential. So we put them into groups. These identifiable lead, uh, potential leaders, put them into groups and give them training. And when the training is given to them, they serve as catalysts for prevention. They go house to house, they have community um, engagement programs, educate the community on why there is a need for the children to be protected. So that's a very important way of, uh, of prevention. And of course, we have this, uh, this young woman too, with the economic engagement and all of that. We give them training in bid making, something that will help them to earn income so that they would be empowered to do what they are doing best. Apart from that, we have put the women, other, uh, other women in, in the communities into self-help groups where we link them up to rural banks, the bank that serves rural populations, so that they would themselves be able to access credit directly from the banks so that we don't come in because our, what we give them is so small. And we, we give them this training. Now, one of the conditions of doing this is that the child must always do his homework. The child must always go to school and all of that. So all that we do is to make sure that you yourself, you are empowered to take care of your own family. Apart from that, there are some of the children who do not know anything. Like me, A, B, C, D, none. One, two, three, no. At the same time, their ages do not allow them to go to school because they, have, they may be 15 years, 16 years, and all of that. The schools are not ready to accept them. These people, we also help them through skills training so that within one year, they will be able to learn something and then do something for themselves and live an independent life. That's what we also do for this group of, uh, of children. So we look at so many aspects. Of course, we also do community sensitization where 
will go to communities and do mass sensitization, preaching the messages, coming out with the, the laws and all of that, so that they know that there's a law. And when they violate it, they will be persecuted. Especially when we had this convention, and when somebody was jailed, we flagged it everywhere. Everywhere. Just to serve as deterrent to others. Yeah. You mentioned the fishing industry. Are there any other industries in Ghana that involve slaves? Thank you. Yes. Um, we have the mining sector, which has uh, a lot of debt bondage. We have the domestic servitude. We have uh, commercial sex exploitation. And then we have this transnational trafficking as well also uh, being perpetuated in the country. But we work more on fishing. And the, the, the enormity of the problem in the fishing is big. If you've ever been to the lake, you see that it's big. The lake starts from the south of Ghana, somewhere around the Volta region, up to the north. If you look at Ghana's map, you see how the lake is. It's so huge. And it has two sides. This side that side. So many villages dotted here, dotted there. And every single village you go, you find a situation there. So that the situation there is big. Also, the extent of abuse in that in, uh, industry is so, so traumatizing that really attention is needed. If you look at mining, there's access. There's road access. So you can easily reach the children and do something about it. And the children themselves, some, sometimes they are able to escape easily. But if you look at this fishing industry, there's no access. There's no access. The first time I took my friend Jeff there, the lake has actually overflowed its banks and swallowed a whole village. So this means that, that whoever children are being enslaved there would have to be taken and be sent further away out of the reach of, of anybody. So that is, that's what makes the enslavement on the fishing lake very, very traumatizing. Yeah. Uh, two more questions. Uh, people that do profound and courageous things like you do, their life is often threatened. Is that true for, for you by people that are organized to enslave these children? Is your life ever been threatened or is it a fear that you have? And the second question, I'm curious about your education. How, uh, where were you educated? And is the education you pursued helpful in, in a direct way with the type of organization you're running? And once again, thank you for sharing thank it you. from a deep uh, um, passionate level. I'll start from the first one, the threat. When we did, after the threat, it's been coming all the time, but it was on a very subtle way. But this year, when we had the first convention happening, it was like boom. I received threat messages, at least 30 threat messages a day, at least, from all over. People threatening my life to kill me, and it was overwhelming. You to the extent that I'll come to the office, sit behind my computer, and almost the whole day, I'll not be able to do anything because my mind was just blowing up. Because I don't know, and I'm not, I was not so much protected. I live in a very basic house, which people can easily access it. I live, uh, we work in a very basic office where people could just walk in. We didn't have a boat. So we're traveling on the same boat as the traffickers. You know, my car was always breaking down uh, on the road. I was once with Jeff, and we were just going, and then the car just shut down in the middle of the traffickers. So it was like I really, I was really afraid for this year. Uh, so the threat, yes, it comes always. Thankfully, um, my friend here, Jeff, helped to get me a strong car, very strong car, so that it protect me. And then another organization uh, secured a different office for us so that we are more protected in that office. And then uh, we also got our own boat that we use to rescue, so we don't have to travel with the traffickers. These are some of the things 
that has been done to uh, protect, protect us, you know, the workers and all of that. The target really was me because they believe that I am a betrayer. I used to work with them. Now I am working against them. So that was a target. And so we had to address all these security uh, needs, uh, concerns. But now it's come down. The threats have come down and uh, things are getting normal. The other question is, Yes, my education. I had my bachelor's degree from the University of Ghana, and I had my master's degree from the uh, University of Education, also in Ghana. And my bachelor's was in psychology. And to me, that was the, you know, it was good that I did psychology. When it was given to me, I said I wouldn't. I mean, I needed to do, I wanted to do accounting. But I realized that it has been very good for me healing myself until recently i couldn't go out sit with people you know chat no everybody i was suspicious of everybody you know until the late 90s so it was really good for me and it also helped me a lot in terms of the work i do then my masters in in communication studies and of course, the communication, uh, I'm a natural writer. So I did that just to help me in writing. But for me, the work I'm doing, what helps me the most is that inner strength that carries me every day. I believe I have certain kind of energy in me that is stronger than my personal body. And that's, that's what keeps me going every time. So in terms of the education that helps me, Fine, it helps me to maneuver my ways and all of that. But day by day, waking up uh, early morning and then sleeping late and going to the bushes and running rivers, paddling the airboat motor and all of that, comes out of that strength that me myself, I cannot explain. That's what carries me on. Okay, um, I have sort of a two-part question. Um, hopefully it's not too long. But... Um, First off, what type of mental health issues are you actually seeing with um, students, well, not, well, kids who are coming back from, um, or, or who are being rescued from the slavery, lo their mental health issues? And secondly, um, West Michigan has been kind of uh, receptive to West African uh, refugees, um, specifically from Sierra Leone, from um, the diamond kind of trade issues, and, and possibly from Ghana. So what, um, I guess, recommendations would you have for counselors or um, others who have to interact with students with kids who are coming back from like these slavery issues who are actually in the, the US or in West Michigan. Um, what, yeah, what um, essentially resources would you say for them to actually interact with these uh, kids? Thank you. Um, the first question, the person who was so good at abusing me sexually walks on the streets of Ghana mad. That person is have gone mentally, uh, is mentally deranged. And that makes it more traumatizing for me because I see this person, you know, a lot of times. And I don't like it. Honestly, I don't like it. And that's why I never talk about it. And I wish it to not play on anywhere. Because, but he's not the only person. He also suffered the same fate as me. But we became a master, you know. That is a cycle. So we have a lot of them. I can say that I could have been a candidate for that mental problem. Because the kind of diving that I needed to do every time and being trapped deep under the waters and then struggling always to come up and the kind of things that I saw and you could see all sorts of animals, like all sorts of different fishes. We have a fish called, uh, we call it Epuprusu. Epuprusu is an electric fish. And if you hold it, it, will, it can arrest you like, like electricity. And you go there trying to disentangle the net, and then you wouldn't know whether that is what has really helped to entangle the net. So you hold the net and then boom, you hold the pupusu and then you are gone. So these are some of the things that 
you come across and and it and it's always played out to you. You see, so we have counselors, very basic counselors for our work. But all the universities in Ghana, we have only one department in one university, University of Ghana, that offers clinical psychology. And they turn out, I think, about five graduates each year. And looking at all the hospitals in Ghana and all the you know, people who need their services, it's very expensive for us to be able to attract such personnel to our program. And therefore, we are not able to get them to do the deep centered counseling that we need. So we just do the basic one. But of course, if we have people who are clinical psychologists, experts, who will help us to get these children deeply out of their situation, out of all the psychosocial trauma, that would be great. Usually, if somebody is coming close to the children, first of all, when you come, we won't tell you who is a victim, who is a survivor. All those who came there, they know that we will not tell you that this person has come out of this situation. No. We just tell you these are our students. That's it. But if you are going close to doing something personal with them, then we tell you. Then there must be somebody who is a member of staff by you to guide you as to how far you can go and how far you cannot go. Sometimes in the process of counseling, you need to stop. No matter how traumatized that person is, you need to stop. Give the person one week or two before you come back. Otherwise, you break the person down and we have to go back and restart the whole thing. So always we have guidance people by you to do the, the counseling. In our school where we have 368 children, you see a lot of the children, not all of them were enslaved. Some of them are from the normal community. But we won't tell you. Because if we tell you, you might have certain way of approaching them, which will stigmatize them. Stigmatization is one very dangerous factor in solving the problem. I remember when I ran away and I came. Everybody was like, was not even prepared to accept me. When I had come myself, I wanted to enroll myself in school, the teachers, every school I went, I went to so many schools, they look at my body, the way my body was so strong and abled. My body was like a caricature something with my stomach very, very huge and, and, and protruding and with balls all over my body. They look at me and they felt that if they had sent me in school, I would abuse other children. Or it was like I was an object. So I went to several schools that never accepted me. The only school that accepted me, of course, later they were happy that they accepted me, was on condition that I would do something for them. And when I came finally to the school, there was no protection. The, the, the teachers needed to have even sympathized with me, at least at that level, and all that has come with me, they could have protected me, but no. Students were shouting at me, they were singing with my name, derogatory, they were doing all sorts of things, even the teachers. I remember, and it's quite funny, we had an environmental studies test, and I had zero over 100. Now, the following day, after the zero over 100, it was a possible answer. So they shaded the correct ones. So as a good student, I copied all the correct uh, answers in my book. The following day, we had French test, also possible answers. I didn't know the difference between French and English, or French and environmental studies. So I copied the answers I gave in the environmental studies into the French answers, uh, questions, as a way of answering it. Because I, didn't, I couldn't differentiate. This teacher, instead of sympathizing with my situation, took a very big, huge cane. And I, I always tell that teacher, he's the same person who really helped me by admitting me, but the same person who made the most traumatizing impact on my life while I was in school. He came me to the extent that I, I, I still remember it all over my body. So this is something that can drive the children away even when they come back. That's what drives them away. Unfortunately, caning is, is almost a culture in our society. 
We are working at it, but it's not been perfect. I also say thank you for attaching your hands and your feet to your passion and rescuing children. I noticed in your video that um, there are some children that seem like they've been so traumatized and mentioned that they are withdrawn. Um, if those children do not become amenable to your mainstream education, what alternatives do you have for them? At the moment, we try as much as possible to look at what the child, him or herself, wants to do. Because we are talking about rights here. So we have to listen to the children. So if the child wants to go to school, we put the child in school. Of course, after counseling. If the child wants to learn skills, we put the child in uh, skills training. What we usually try to encourage the older children to do, especially those between the ages of uh, 14, and 18, is that it's usually a long way in school, if only they can stay. But sometimes they go, they, can, they think they can go to school, but they end up you know, dropping out. So we encourage them to do school training, which will make them independent and empowered within one year. Because school, you're talking about about seven years. But for the skills training, you know, very short time, you are on yourself. So that's what we do. We don't have the capacity at the moment to keep the children whose parents we are unable to trace because we don't have a permanent home for them. So we try as much as possible to locate foster parents to take care of them. And then we do the same things that we would have done for a family, also for that foster parent. So that is what we do. We look at them and then identify the needs and solve that, that problem. There is one boy you saw me where he was hit by the parents. He remained in our shelter for more than six months because we were not able to trace the family. Even as at now, we have not been able to trace the family. So it's now with the foster parent. That's what we do. But when the child is with the foster parent, then we have more responsibility because that foster parent doesn't have that as much responsibility as the real uh, parent. It's like he or she is doing us a favor. So monitoring is more intense. Resource is a bit more closely monitored and, uh, and I added on and so on and so forth. That's what happens. Um, thank you. Thank you for, oh, great, over here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank you for coming. I think what you're doing is a huge step towards something that needs to happen all over the place. Um, my question to you, with no disrespect, but it's an honest question, um, is that I, I've been to Lake Volta. I've seen the area, and I, I know what it's like. I've seen the environment. And um, my question is, um, whether it's labor trafficking, sex trafficking, um, the industry I feel will always exist. Um, there's too much money to be made for people to just leave it alone and realize that they're wrong in what they're doing. Um, somewhat comparable, which shouldn't be, but to the drug industry. Um, when the resources are humans and they're endless, the poverty's endless, the money to be made is endless, um, the people who wanna make money is endless, and then you have a huge, um, population of government and other people who don't admit that this is happening, do you personally honestly see an end to human trafficking in the future? I'm not saying near future, but in the future in general, uh, do you see this as something that could possibly happen? Yeah, it's possible. It's really possible. You know why? Because we are making the industry of human trafficking something that is not tolerable. You see, it's not just about they wanting to make money. If you make money, you make money in fairness. Hire adult labor, let them work for you, pay them fair wages, and don't exploit other children. So we are going to make the industry ungovernable if they continue to use children. Fortunately for us, I can admit that the situation as it used to be when I was enslaved, it's, it's different. The, the, 
the sheer numbers of children who were being used at the time is not the same. So it's, I can say that it's reducing. And it's reducing because there has been a lot of efforts on the way. All we need is to push small, all of us. How to push small, and that will be it. Because now, even with one persecution, the number of children being returned speaks for itself. So if we are able to do two more, three more, then they know that the law is closer to them than ever. And as we continuously use our boat to survey uh, the lake, and as we continuously, once in a while, bring police in their uniform on the lake, as we continuously rescue children, bring the children back to just showcase them how the children are doing after we rescuing them, the children themselves will come to us. The fishermen themselves will bring the children to us. The community themselves will then form a resistant group to say that this community, no child trafficking. If they are empowered, they will say no. If a whole community is, is punished because of trafficking, nobody would like to be involved whenever punishment comes. So everybody would like to own the other person out. If you bring a child, what we are doing also is to institute a community register in some of those communities. We know all the children in this community, we, and then we rescue them. If any child comes into the community, the community themselves will find out what is this children doing here? Who brought them? Are they enslaved? Are, you, are they your own children? Then they will let us know if they are enslaved and we'll come and rescue them. So the community themselves will resist trafficking in that way. A month, two months, three months, one year, two years, we are done. So uh, yes, the problem is solvable. We will be able to solve it. And I believe that I can count on everybody to support us to solve this problem. James, James thanks so much. You're I welcome. know earlier tonight I mentioned impact and the amount of impact that people have told me <coughs> just by listening to you talk. And if I may say so, I think I underestimated that amount of imp impact. Um, incredible tonight. Um, I'd have to say, you're, you've changed my life, definitely. And going forward, if you think about tomorrow is going to be different than today, isn't it? Because I'm always going to have that voice in the back of my head telling me, quit complaining, it's not that bad. And I'm not trying to make light of it. But definitely, you've changed my life, and I'm sure you've changed a lot of lives here tonight. Um, thanks so much again for your time. Thank you. If I could, I'd like to go over some of the other events that are going to happen throughout this week. But first of all, let's give a big round of applause for James Kofi and I. <laughs>